get started. So, at this point, we are in guys. Are you all finished assignment one? You finished. You guys, you can start on with some problems. What I'm making? Yeah, it's not worth it. So, here are the few facts that you may be interested in. So, you don't have to complete all of assignment one to get started for assignment two. Because uh, assignment two only relies on log implementations. So, as long as you've got log work, it's fine for you to go ahead to continue on to log for assignment two. And you will need most of assignment two for assignment three. Right? Um, so, because assignment two provides the, actually the user infrastructure for the operating system, like the system calls and process support. And here's another proof fact is that the SAM2 solution won't be provided even after these deadlines. Which means if you want to do a SAM3, you have to do a SAM2 anyway. Before or after the deadline. You definitely want to do it before the deadline, not after. Right? You get what I'm saying? So my suggestion would be start a SAM2 right now. Because it's quite tight, you have to write design documents, you have to uh, implement all those system calls and process calls. It's a lot of job to do. So you want to start it as soon as possible. And don't get stuck on any coding questions. And because some of the questions are, are probably make more sense to you only after you have done, you have written the code, you have done some coding, then you can come back on those coding questions. There is no separate deadline for the code review questions. So you can answer them anytime you want before deadlines. Right? And before the whole deadline, which is March 13th, you can always go back to a 7 1 to finish whatever you have left over. Uh, once you got pretty much uh, most of our 7 2 done. All right? um, so I would suggest don't. Try to wrap, up, wrap it up for assignment one by end of today. If you are still not going to make the work, forget about it. Try start get started on uh, assignment two. And for assignment two, we have as usual we have uh, fourteen code questions, and I would suggest you to skip them. Some of them maybe you definitely have no clue. You don't have you have no idea what the problem is about. So you can. Step is skip them. And then you have to submit a two page design document. Uh, in this design document, you will list in detail how you're going to use file table looks like, for example, how your process structure looks like, how do you allocate the PIDs, how do you allocate the FDs, and what, what happens to open and read write, read write when you, uh, what happens to your file table when you open read write. And then it comes to the actual implementation part. We have a bunch of file system related six calls, like open read write, um, change directory, get current working directory, and process related system calls for index. This means you have to actually design two subsystems. One is a file subsystem where you need to design a file table, which is a call of this system. And another is a process system. So for, for each process, we have to maintain some, some information. Has this process exited? If it's exited, what's the return value of it? What's the PID of it? How to coordinate between wait, parent wait and child exit and all that. And these two subsystems are not totally independent. So the file sys calls are not relying on any process sys calls. But when you work on form or exam, you have to think of what happens to a file table when you do form. So you need to actually clone the file table from the parent to the child as well. Right? So my suggestion would be work on the file subsystem first. That's much easier. Once you, once you get a file system course done, you have basic print of support for the user space. So you can print out values, see what's going on in the user space. And then we'll move, move to the process code. 
because it's very difficult to work at another level. Um, so at this point, you may wonder how do you get started? There are so many things to do. You need to write, answer query questions, you need to write design documents, you need to implement a bunch of things for us. So first of all, there is no necessary to be panic, to panic, right? Because this operating system was one system that has been developed by more than 10 years. Thousands of students have done all these assignments. You should definitely be able to die. And also, at Harvard, they only have two weeks at all, in, in total, or 72. So now you guys have a little more than two weeks, two and a half weeks at this point. So you should be able to do it if you try your best. And then uh, you need to understand the whole system, how the whole system works. By how it works, I mean how does the user space open function get to a kernel, get to the system open you write? How do you actually open the file and then return the file descriptor to the user space? So the whole from user space to kernel mode, handling the syscall go back to the whole, the whole process. And also, um, so as I already said, you want to design your file subsystem first. So the call of the file subsystem is the file table. So what's the file table looks like? What's the entry of the file table? How do you find available file descriptors and so on? And then there are three basic system calls. Open, so you can actually read and write on the device and read and write. So I would suggest you work on this syscall first, make sure that it works, uh, and then try some basic user program like b true, b force, or um, some other basic user programs that does nothing but just print out something and fix it. And then for the process subsystem, um, so some functionality has been already provided to you. Right? So when you launch, at this point, when you launch your kernel and you can get it to the menu, you can actually use a p command to execute some program, like p being true, p being false. Right? So it means the current system has already have some support for the process, just that it's not complete. So it's very important to understand first how the initial or how the basic functionality, functionalities are implemented for the processes and system calls. And the wrong program is as the call of the process system. So the wrong program will actually load the executable in ELF format and launch it into the memory space, set up the CPU so you can run it. This is basically very similar to the exec uh, syscall you need to implement. So exec also need to load some ELF uh, executable binary format launch it into kernel, set up the various tech pointers, PCs, and let it run. So when you implement the exec, you can use this run program as an example. For the process of system calls, I would suggest, suggest you work on for and exec first. So for is the process of creating a new process, create a new process, and exec is the uh, is the uh, is a way to actually rep replace the um, current thread with a whole new thread. So you can, after work, the whole parent and child thread are the same. So you want to do exact on the child thread, so the child can actually do something else more interesting. And suppose you got all this done, so it's time to wrap up on and get all the minor system by minor, I mean like uh, the get CWD, um, deal to LC stuff in file system calls, and wait and exit in the process system calls. So when you design the file system call, uh, actually general system calls, you need to um, have an idea how the system call works. Either it's a file system call like open the right, or it's a process system call like or that. How do you, your system call get a call from user space? It helps 
you to understand the, the if you it can give you a big picture of what happened. So you don't get lost get lost when you want to walk only walk on a very small piece of the um, of the big picture. So first of all, how does the user actually track it? So how can a user program through some mechanism to get it to request a system call? And how does the kernel know it's a system call? Because when there is an interrupt, it's not necessarily a system call, right? We have uh, maybe device interrupt, maybe timer interrupt, we have all kinds of interrupts. So how does the kernel know it's a system call instead of other interruption types? And how does the kernel know which system call? So all right. So kernel suppose the kernel already know. Okay, this is a system call. But we have uh, all kinds of system calls. Which system call does the user want to perform? Right. So suppose you are kernel. You have to figure it out. Right. Suppose you are designing the system. And how does the kernel get arguments for the system call? So okay, the kernel has figured out the user wants to open a file. But where is the file map? Where is the flag? Where is the mode? How does the kernel get all that? Right? And it's important, it's especially important in the, some unusual system calls like in LC. So in LC, the functionality is simple, but the, the interface is a little bit not very straightforward. They have 64 bit argument that we have noticed. So the second argument of the LC is the offset. And offset is a 64 bit uh, variable. So how do, I, how do you pass a 64 bit argument in a 34 bit, a 32 bit architecture or machine? Right? And how does the kernel actually handle the system call? This is the part where you worry about in this assignment. So you does the actual dirty work. Handle the system call. And after you handle your system call, how does the user know the results of the system call? So, user wants to open a file, okay, you open it. But how do you return the file is quicker in this space? These are all the problems <coughs> you need to do. Suppose there is nothing and you want to design a kernel. These are all the problems you need to consider. But fortunately, OS 1C1 has already taken care of most of them. Oh, you only need to do step 5 in this, uh, in this assignment. But it's better to understand how the other parts work. Right? Well, you don't want to, how, why do I want to know all this? Am I supposed to just do 5 and I'm not good? So, um, when you implement a small part of a big system, it's very important to have a whole picture, a big picture of how the system works. So when you do interfa interface between the system, uh, like what's your system open, the function looks like. So you decide what arguments are there. And how do you get all those arguments in each other and how you pass those arguments need, right? And so when you return some values, which where should you write all those values? That part you, you must need to understand. So um, it's always always not not bad to have a whole picture, a big picture in your, in your mind when you only need to do a small part of the of the system. And you know, like I said, it's very important for some system implementation which get on you. Um, algorithm passing and the two values. Alright. So today we're going to look at all this one by one. So first of all, how does the user track it? Any guess? Syscall? Directory. Syscall? What is syscall? You mean the instruction? Or whatever. How exactly does the user specify? I knew, I knew the data is the trap frame structure. Trap? It, it's not even close. Data structure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, I mean, uh, so a user program is running. 
how does the user from getting to her? Uh, I mean, enters uh, privilege mode. When it enters, privilege how does the enter privilege mode? Interrupt. Okay. Interrupt. Right. If everything is okay, why there is an interrupt? No, I think he means that he raises it. it raises yes, so you either yeah. need to raise a software interrupt yeah, yeah. or software interrupt uh, exception. Yeah. Right? As Jeff has talked about in the lecture. So there has to be a way for the user to request a system call, to request a software exception, instead of just a divide by zero. That's a bad exception. Then we want some normal workable exception that user can explicitly require, request from the kernel. Right? So in MIPS, there is a syscall instruction. So this is actually one instruction called syscall. So if user do this instruction or execute this instruction, there will be a software exception by the way. So the CPU will first do about a whole stuff to manipulate the exception status and trap in the kernel. So that's how the user space go to kernel space. And in Intel or x86 processors, it's not maybe the exact instruction there. Last time I checked, there is an instruction in Intel x86 assembly called int for interrupt. That instruction is also the same function here to let the user enter, to raise a software exception. And here is the actual code that reads the exception. So in this file, we can see that it's in user space. User lib and libc for this architecture. So first of all, it's in user space, right? And secondly, it's in a special directory called arc. Why is that? Yes. So this syscall instruction is specifically for MIPS. On Intel, it's maybe not this instruction. So that's what, how we maintain the machine dependent the machine independent stuff. So this is the syscall instruction. After this instruction, we get into kernel case. So we will take look back to this part uh, later. So now just don't don't uh, bother with this. So after this, so suppose user want to issue a syscall, what you need to do is just use this instruction. And then boom, we get we came into kernel space. So recall that what happens when there is interrupt. So first of all, we the hardware will set the current privilege mode to kernel privilege, progressive privilege to kernel. And then the hardware need to figure out what just happened. Right? What caused the interruption? Is it from hardware or from users, from soft software? And then the hardware will set the uh, program counter or the point uh, instruction pointer that is called to a predefined memory location. Is um, again, it's machine dependent. Is this address in MIPS? So now the program is done. Get exactly in this address. Is so uh, the kernel actually placed a small uh, interrupt handler in that address, which is very short, just to jump to the common exception, like I have already explained. So in the common exception, what it does is to first save all the user context, all the registers, because later on the kernel will do some stuff that glues the, the, all the registers. So before that, we need to first save the user context. So after the syscall or the interruption, the user can resume the execution. And then um, this function will set up the kernel state so we can make function calls. And then we call this, um, this is the real uh, interrupt handle called MIPS trap. This is written in C code, which is more easy to read. And after this function, we are supposed to already handle the C call or the interrupt. We return to user mode at the end of the common exception. Okay. Um, yeah. You have put this back in, you can find it online. This slice will be posted online after Friday. 
and the left slice for today's lecture is already on. Yeah. Because this is a recitation, not a lecture. Okay. Um, so, how does the kernel figure out the interruption is actually for Cisco? Right. Remember, at this point, the hardware has already figured out the path and stored the cause of the interruption to some register. What the kernel needs to do is just to check that register and figure out the best path. So identify the cause of the interrupt and then call red in the handler. So the main part of the news uh, trap, there is a code snippet. Uh, actually, the news trap is quite complicated. It's quite long. This part is relevant to the Cisco subsystem. So first, we get the code for the interruption. And then, if the code is exsys, which is some kind of major number, and we call the Cisco function to handle the system call. So there is one code read question for them to relate to this. Ask you what's the, I don't remember exactly, but more. Basically, it asks you what's the national number for this body image. And then you enter it into the Cisco function. So, first of all, so there has to be some convention that the user tells the kernel which Cisco to do, to perform. The convention is that the user will put the Cisco number in a register called V0. It's an agreement between the user and the kernel. So the kernel, all the kernel needs to do is just to read the value of this V0 uh, register, which will be the call number. And then here comes a bunch of switch case, 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 case block. So switch the call number. If it's reboot, I do reboot. If it's time, I do the time. And about that. So now you can imagine that if you want your if you want your kernel to handle file system calls, say open, how do you how are you supposed to do that? Add another switch. Add yeah, add another case. Yeah. Case open, I do my open. Case read, I do my read quick. Right? Just add more cases here. Continue. So after this switch case block, the syscall are supposed to already be handled be taken care of. Now is the problem to how to return the value of to user space, the result of this one. Right? Um, oh no, before that, when you handle the Cisco, say you already know that you don't want to do open, then you still need to figure out which file the user wants to open, in what mode the user wants to open. That's all about the algorithms. Right? So there has to be a way for the kernel to figure out all, this, the, all those information. And again, that is another convention of the uh, algorithm passing from user space to kernel space. So in MIPS, um, if we call a function, the first arguments will be placed in these special registers from Z E0 to E3. Each of them is a 32-bit register. So at most, we can put up, up to four uh, arguments. That's OK for open, right? Because open only have three arguments. Uh, but and each of the argument is 32 bit. So it's very normal case. And then what about the 54 bit arguments? Like in LC. So LC, we have 64 bit arguments. And it will be placed in a line register. Find a line, meaning that so one 64 bit value will take up to two uh, registers. So E0 and E1 are aligned, E2 and E3 are aligned. So this the value can either be E0, E1, or E2, E3. It, it, it cannot cross the boundaries. So if we have extra arguments, we have more than four arguments, the extra argument will be placed in the user stack at this address. So, in, so let's take a look at a few examples. So first, with open, it's all conventional. 
we have a first uh, pointer farmhand, flex, mode. So the farmhand will be go to, we go to E0. Flag will go to E1. And mode will go to E2. That, that's all normal, right? Now LC. So the first argument of LC is file descriptor, 32 bit. And then position, 64 bit. And then width. Um, it's uh, 32 bit. So FD will go to E0, and this position, as I already mentioned, 64 bit arguments can only be aligned with this E1, we cannot pass into E1, E2. That won't be aligned. So E1 is skipped, and then we pass the uh, position into E3, E2, and E3. E2 will be the higher 32 bit position of the position. And A3 will be the lower to the bit of the position. So you need to figure out a way to reassemble re the higher 32 bit and lower 32 bit into one single 64 bit position before you can actually call your LC. Yeah, uh, how, I mean, how, how are the register aligned? Aligned? Yeah. Uh, aligned means so. So from 0, 1, 2, 3, okay. 0 and 1 are, are aligned. 2 and 3 are aligned. That's it. And 1 and 2 are not aligned. That's it. So you know, yeah. Any other questions? OK. Um, so this is argument password. And so now you have, you have a very clear picture of what you don't want to do. You know this uh, system call. You know which system call, and you know how to perform the system call. Now, now you suppose you do your job and write your sysopen or sysfc. And after that, how are you supposed to return the value to the user space? Say sysopen, okay, you are supposed to return FD, file disclosure, to user space. Radio service, conventions, again. So, the convention, the current convention of MIPS is that if the syscall is OK, then you set E3 to 0. Everything is OK. And you return the actual return value in V0 or V0, V1, depending on the size of the return value. And if something is wrong, like the user wants to open a non existent file, then you should return failure. So on failure, E3 will be set to 1. Indicating that oh, there's something wrong with this this call, and then V0 will be the error number to the exact reason why the this call didn't succeed. So, for example, in open, open just return a normal circle bit integer. So after test, this will be zero. Indicating there is no error. V1 will be happy for the file description. And um, and for LC is not. Is different from open in that the return value is actually 64 bit. So as usual, each bit is zero, meaning there is no error, and the offset should be in V0 and V1. So V0 is the higher 32 bit of the return offset, and V1 will be the lower 32 bit of the return offset. So for offset for LC, after you have done your job. You have also need to unpack your return value and store them into V1 and V0 separately. Okay. Yeah. Uh, inside open, the actual open is part, we can use the kernel, kernel call set. Whatever kernel Use what? Or open. Yeah. For doing that, we can use the actual kernel call set. Right? Use actual what? Kernel call set to open file. You mean the VFS open stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. I'll cover that. Yeah, yeah that's about how to do an actual open stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, so let's quickly go back to um, where we, in user space, the user do syscall stuff. Let's see how user tag the two values of the syscall. So, this syscall will trap into kernel. And then kernel will do all kinds of job to perform this call. And then it will return here. 
So, so at this point, the Cisco has been completed. So, so in the space, in user space, we first check history. If it's zero, we jump to here, which we just return. Everything is fine. V0 is a return value. And if it's not zero, meaning something won't happen. So we here we uh, set um, read the value of the V0 predictor, write it to the error number, the global variable, and then we set V0 as we want those to be negative one, indicating there's an error. So that's why when you call open in user space, so if FD equals to open less than zero or equals to negative one, that's how the negative one comes. And you know that the actual reason as part of this error network is very much. And then we return. All right. Any problem so far? The error number, what we stored is up to us, right? There's no kernel does not have to support. Yeah, this is user set stuff. You don't need to support it. This is all there. So now the big picture is, first of all, the user placed the arguments in the registers A0 and A0 to A3 and used the Cisco instruction to call the software instruction, trap into kernel, the kernel will identify what has happened, if a Cisco, what was the call number, what's the arguments, and dispatch a system call to various kind of handlers, and after handle the system call, uh, we will have Cisco result test them in uh, corresponding uh, registers and return to usable. So here is a big picture of the Cisco system, how Cisco works. What do you need to do is this. So just a very tiny piece of the whole system. Now you don't feel that's something to do, not that much. <laughs> so you don't have to work out. Okay, everybody got the bigger picture? Cool. And so, another immediate question when you're trying to work on this Cisco, maybe how do I add a Cisco? It's not, it's not that simple that just add one line or two line of case in the Cisco function. Case, sysopen, call my open. Well, that's the main part, but that's not all of it. So, so suppose you want to add a syscall for syscall. First of all, because you have micro syscalls for um, software engineering stuff, you may want to put them in one C file, right? So you, you may want to create a C file or file syscall.c in this directory. This is not rec uh, required. This is just a um, recommendation of personal. So you can pass this file anywhere else. To just put it in the syscall directory. And then you implement your sysway function there to figure out what arguments you need. You have to read the main page of the read to see what arguments the user passed in. And then, um, so whenever you have a new C file, you want to edit this configuration file so that actually your C file will be actually be compiled. So if you don't edit this file, you edit your C file, the kernel doesn't know the existence of this C file. So no matter what kind of crazy stuff you write in the file, the kernel will compile it. So there will be no error, and you'll be happy, but it won't work. All right? And so go to that file, search this file name. Then it will tell you how to do with your own file. So use this file as an example. And so whenever you have a C file, you implement a bunch of function. You want to declare the, C, the function prototypes in header file. So we can call that function in other C files by just including the header file. Right? So suppose, well, this is again a personal recommendation. You can add this file 
command in the kernel include directory and include this file in the kernel admin sysbox.c. Then, so in sysbox.c, you can actually call your face read in the switch case block. Now come to the second part is the file syscall or file subsystem design. So the core part of the file syscall is the file handle. Right? It's all about how to manipulate the file handles. So at the very earliest lectures of this semester, Jeff talked about three levels of interactions. What's that? What are they? So first we have uh, most uh, up, up, up level, yeah, file descriptors. And then those file descriptors point to a uh, file handle, right? File handle points to a file object. And the file object points to an actual file on disk. Right? Why do we have all those three level interactions? Because different of them actually have different visibility, right? So this file descriptor is private to each process. I can have a file descriptor called 304. You can also have a file descriptor called 304. It's private to each process. And this file handle is to provide, it's also provide private to each process. But it can be shared by the parent and child process. Right? So after four, actually the so suppose I'm a parent thread the child thread. We both have a file descriptor. I have five, and he has maybe six, but we point to the same file handle. So file handle can be shared by limited number of processes. And file object is system-wise. So for each physical file on the physical disk, there is one physical, sorry, it's not physical, there is one file object for that. So file object can be shared by literally unlimited number of processes. And in this assignment, so file descriptor is just integers, no big deal. And so the core part is what's the file handle looks like. And the file object is just a window. Again, it's provided to you. So you don't need to do all the low level of block manipulation, how to read the block, read how to block, you don't have to do that. You can just use the DNA. So the, in this three level of interaction, you, you just need to design the file handle. And more specifically, you want to, uh, so before that, so make sure you understand the window operations before you do a file system calls. Because the current code has actually provided to you a bunch of um, operations you can do on window. Like open, read, read, write, change directory, and all that. So you don't have to reinvent all those functions. You just need to find out which function to call, which the correct functions to uh, um, so the window is defining this as a file representing a physical file on disk, and it can be manipulated using a bunch of VOP macros. Also in these files, so for example, the most two important ones are VOP read and VOP write. So this will handle uh, which blocks are this file in on disk, how to read that block, and how to do all that stuff. So in your sysread, you don't have to deal with all this hardware or low level detail stuff. You can just you just need to figure out how to use these records or tools to do the job. And also the VFS system has defined a bunch of High level operations on window you can do on the so for example this open 
uh, you can just call VFS Open to actually open the file. VFS Open will return you a window, so you don't have to create a window yourself. Then just close, VFS change the library, and all that. So make sure you go to that file, find out what's already in there, and you don't do you don't repeat the job. Okay. Um, so what are you supposed to do in the file system stuff? Is actually most of the hardware for this part has been already handled by the VFS system. So you don't have to do that. You just need to figure out what's the right function to call. And you need to design your file table. So it maintains, so user gives you a file. So first of all, when you call you, when user call open, you need to figure out what, what file is quicker you want to return. Right? Later on, when you call read, and provide you with a descriptor. You need to figure out what's this descriptor, what's the, what's the corresponding file handle to that descriptor. And then the exact structure of file handle. So what information you need to keep for each file handle. And, and also, user wants to open a file, say, or read. Does that file exist? If it's not, what happens? Does even the file name value and all that. So a large part of job for assignment two is other than checking. You have to deal with all kinds of bad arguments. You have to assume every argument from user is potentially invalid. So you need to defend against that. And also deal with file handle share. By that I mean, um, so okay, initially the file handle is just private, private to one thread. One that's right call for. Actually, now we have two threads sharing the same file handle. How do you synchronize the access to this file handle? Okay. All the problems you need to consider. So when you design your file table, you want to make sure you be able you be able to answer these questions. Where should the file handle be? Oh, sorry, file table be. Right. It's, since it's thread private, you want to put it in the thread structure and nowhere else. And what data structure you want to use? Speaking of data structure, I mean array, linked list, tree, partner tree, the tree, all that stuff. You have to make a decision, right? So what kind of data structure that you can actually so file descriptor is actually an integer. What's more convenient or what's most convenient to give an integer from the end? Yeah, array. Big place you have to scan this. Array is just directly index. Uh, right? So array is one option. And where should you initialize and deinitialize the file and file table? So when you create a thread, you have to initialize the file table. When you destroy or when you destroy a thread, you have to deinitialize the file table. Right? And how do you find out the next available file descriptor to return? Basically, you need to devise some kind of file descriptor uh, management mechanism to handle this. And, oh, and about file handle is in the entry of the file handle. So, how do you tell where the next read and write should be? So, you don't want to read, but the user doesn't provide you a offset. Right? In read function, there is no offset. That where should you start from? Read? Start reading. Right from right. offset. Okay. Yeah. But user do not provide you offset. Mm -hmm. Did you read by, file file by the handle? Uh, yeah. So in file handle, you have to maintain the offset information. So when I first open, the offset is zero. Yeah. Then you will read 100 bytes. You have to remember that 100 bytes. So later on, when you do another read, you have to start from that 100 bytes instead of. So you need to keep some kind of offset information in the file. How do you tell if the read or write operation is valid? So say I open a file as read only, but uh, later on I write the file. You should reject it. But how can you do that? Yes, exactly. So in a file handle, you have to remember what's the permission of the file when you open it. 
if the permission is read only, then when I get a white syscall on this file, I should return some error code. And how do you tell the actual file object associated with file center? By actual file object, I mean the windows of file center. That's simple. And can file handle be shared? Yes. Yes. It can be shared by parent and child's parent. Then how do you synchronize the access to the file? Log. Log. That's why I say log is a minimum for us to. You have to synchronize the access to it. So, when a file handle is shared by two processes, what happens if one of the processes close the file? Can you destroy the file handle? No. no. Because another has already re has still reference to this file. So you need to keep another maybe small piece of information on to help you decide when you get a sysclose system call, can you actually close the file or not? So this is pretty much for today. We talk about the, the whole picture, how this call works, the questions to ask when design a file table. And next week, we will maybe cover on these sample um, file system calls, the process of system calls. Yeah. At that time, do we do it in user space? Do we do it before you send it to the call? No, 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 you do it in your system. <coughs> yeah, you have a system.